Welcome to another video on my shitty YouTube channel about my investing journey. And you read that headline right. The other night I was engaging in some libations. I was getting drunk. And why I think this is a useful thing for new investors is it's a teachable moment on what I did. So I got drunk and I may have taken some Ambien too on top of that. And I was reading some of the financial stuff and I came across an article on Berkshire Hathaway and just out of curiosity, I looked up what Berkshire Hathaway's intrinsic value is. If you don't know what intrinsic value is, let me just give you a summary of it. It's a useful tool for investors to kind of help you ignore the noise of the market. The idea of intrinsic value is a vital concept in investing. Put simply, intrinsic value is the perceived or calculated value of an asset, an investment, or a company. There are many formulas and calculations you can root you can use to arrive at this figure, but the basic idea behind all of them is the same. Intrinsic value has no relation to the company's share price. They are two completely different things, even though some an analysts might tell you otherwise. All in all, it's not the go-to to figure out whether you want to buy a, any particular stock, but it's a useful metric when weighed against other metrics when you're evaluating a company. And so, yeah, the intrinsic value, according to Focus Guru, was 209. I bought it at 178. So it's up to 182. I didn't lose money on the idea or on the, on the, I didn't lose money on the purchase. Seeking Alpha says that it's, intrinsic value is $289 a share. Now, the reason I bring this up is don't just buy something based on one little thing that you looked at. Berkshire Hathaway was something that I was looking into. And this, my teachable moment in here is don't be in your Vanguard account when you're getting drunk and then make, make purchase of stocks like you're drunk eBaying. So I just wanted to make you aware of the investing mistake that I made this week or this past week. So the next thing that I wanted to bring up with people is this. This is why my little stunt here kind of put a, put a damper on my uh, idea for the next, what I'm going to be doing for the next couple months in investing. So. I came across this article today and it's something I was just running the numbers. I looked at the S and P 500. I'm like, there's no way there should, should be this kind of valuation. You can get into a lot of it as people are fleeing into the tech stocks because they're perceived as safer. You know, bonds aren't paying anything right now and cash isn't, isn't get paying you any interest either. So they're fleeing and it's driving up the price of tech stocks, such as Tesla, which is in a bubble. I don't care what you say, it is. But <clears throat> stocks are the most expensive since the 1980s based on one critical metric, and that's the peg ratio. And I just bring this up because it's just a teachable moment the PEG ratio is a valuation metric for determining the relative trade-off between the price of a stock, the earnings generated per share, and the company's expected growth. In general, the P ratio is higher for a company with higher growth rate. Thus, using just PE ratio would make high growth companies appear overvalued relative to others. And it is assumed that by dividing the PE ratio by, PE ratio by the earnings growth, the resulting ratio is better for comparing companies with different growth rates. Depending on the industry, generally a peg ratio of one means that the company is at fair value. Now, the S&P 500's peg ratio is 1.8 right now. It's sitting at an all-time of 1.8. And this was 
just my investment philosophy that I've been experimenting with lately is due to the volatility in the market. One of the worst things you can do is try and time the market because generally people are terrible at doing it. And all the research says that people who try to time the market end up getting lower returns than people that just dollar cost average. But my thought on it was a boglehead approach. Most of my money is in mutual funds. And then I buy a few key stocks that I think I can make money on in the long term. And then I spend a little bit of money on stocks I think I can swing trade, kind of like I did when I bought American Airlines at $9 and something. And then I ended up, I didn't look it up, but it was like $9 I bought in, I sold it at 17. The same thing happened with Boeing. I got in at 125 and then I got greedy I saw that it was, it was at 2.30 and all my instinct was telling me, sell this stock, but I didn't. And then I watched it drop and I got out at 190. Now, the reason I'm just bringing this up with people is with COVID still burning down the economy, like an arsonist on devil's night, that picture that little girl, that evil little girl, it looks like she set the house fire. This, and it being an election year, this is going to be an extremely volatile year. The stock market is overheated. And my opinion is there's gonna be a lot of dips and valleys coming up, especially look for a sell off if Joe Biden wins the presidency. So my idea was dollar cost average, don't buy anything, just stack my cash, my play money, just stack it for when the market dips and that way I can buy stocks I think I can make money on or chuck it back into my mutual fund because we're at all time highs. And buying Berkshire Hathaway right now really wasn't part of the plan. So my, my, I guess my main thing that I want you to take away from this is don't get drunk and buy stocks. Also write down your plan and stick to it and don't use one one metric to, to evaluate whether you should be purchasing a stock. So let's go in and see what my M1 finance account has done for the week ending on 7-11-2020. I'm sure it's gonna be a barn burner. And if you don't know, I call this channel Journey to Thousandaire. And the reason that I do that is to make fun of people that put millionaire in front of their name because nobody that's really a millionaire and made their money that way puts millionaire in front of their name. That's just to scam you out of your money. So we're going to check out my journey in M1 finance to thousandaire status. And what I do is I just put a dollar a day, 30 bucks a month into my M1 account. It's play money. And then I put my Visa cash back rewards in there to show you how with a little bit of money, you can generate wealth over the long term, and also it contains different investing styles. So let's take a look at my M1 finance account. Okay, welcome back. And we're looking at my M1 finance account. Right over here, I want you to see, last month it ended with $10. This is me building up cash reserves, where I'm gonna put my actual cash back rewards money, because I believe that we are going to see a bunch of dips and valleys in the next couple months. So let's look at what kind of activity I've gotten. And nothing really that much. Vanguard Extended Duration Index Fund, Treasury, 24 cents. And Vanguard Long Term Bond ETF, 1 cent. And the total bond market, 14 cents. I should just go in and quit my job now. All right. So looks like Mr. Hand's Lazy 2 fund is up 2% for a market gain of $1.44. And that is, of course, just the Vanguard total stock market and the Vanguard total bond market, which this is just a take on the classic 60-40 bonds and stocks portfolio. I don't know how much I agree with that. I think you're fine if you have enough money just keeping it in mutual funds. This is the Uniballer. It's up 7.75%. 
for a market gain of $3.04. So this is just the Vanguard total stock market, Vanguard total bond market, and the Vanguard total international stock market. I don't actually agree that you need the international stock market because when you go and look at the funds, most of them contain mostly U.S. companies. This is my first creep pie. This is the one I made. It's up 37.73%. And no, I'm not a genius. It's just because of the massive run in tech. It's got the Vanguard. It would be up further if I hadn't put these in there. But, which I probably should have. But I just went with a traditional investing approach. Alibaba is up 48.63%. Apple is up 54%. Amazon is up 108%. Tesla is up 117%. Microsoft, 53%. Square, 151%. Walmart, 17.59%. I mean, you guys can read this. And here's my losers, Berkshire Hathaway. It, I just talked about it. Maybe I shouldn't have bought that. Disney, I'm not worried about this one. Target, Union Pacific, it's a railroad. It's going to be reliable. And of course, JP Morgan Chase and Bank of New York. Bank stocks are going to be down for the foreseeable future, which is actually an opportunity to buy. My hobo's left boot. This is a Vanguard total stock market. A little bit riskier take on it with the extended duration treasuries. They're up 23%. Total world market, 8.62%. And then total bond market at 9%. And that is up 17.22% for a gain of $5.79. Mississippi mud pie is up 11. Half of these I don't even remember. Okay, this is just a take on the traditional Boglehead approach. Full disclosure, I'm going to create a portfolio in here that mirrors mine as close as I can approximate. Tesla, Microsoft. Yeah, I think everything is just overheated right now. Total stock market. I'm not surprised that's down, but I'm not worried about that. It's going to return about 10% over the lifetime anyways. The Dutch oven. Vanguard total stock market. Another just take on Boglehead style approaching. I really like this ETF. If, I, if you notice, it's in a lot of my stuff. Because you get all the tech companies in once. It returned 20% over the past bull run. Bangkok bareback. That's when I just went with super risky stuff. Vanguard total stock market, Vanguard small cap ETF, extended duration, and the Vanguard bond market. It's risky because of these two. Small caps are extremely volatile. I don't see the point in buying small caps because it really, when you look at it, doesn't return that much better. This is Dave Ramsey's approach. That's why it's called the Ramsey. Um, see what I mean? This is always dragging down portfolio performance. Then we'll go to a bucket of hooker spit. Vanguard, it's made up of the Vanguard information technology. Full disclosure, I really just wanted to own this anyways. That's why I put it in here. Extended duration, total bond market, consumer staples, utilities, and a high dividend yield. If you have one that you want to see play out in here, I'm open to ideas on this. This is randoms. 
what I did here is just as uh just to uh all right, all right. Welcome, welcome to this video, video on how all right I'll cut that out or maybe I'll just leave it in to show you a mistake but um anyways <laughs> can't believe I did that I set this one up because it, I wanted to show you that even just randomly picking stocks you can make money they really it's returned 10.2 percent and i used a random number generator and so yeah that's what that one does and then this that i skipped over all this is is a targeted date fund it moves you into that albeit it's made up of etfs by uh m1 finance but that's just meant to show that a good way to start investing is just a targeted date fund, 95% in it, and then just buy stocks that you'll think can break out with 5% of your money. This is beer and hooker money. And all this is is a high dividend portfolio I set up. To show you that just investing in high dividend paying stocks is probably not the best strategy. It's up 8.93%. Earn dividends $1.83. And then it can capital. And that's just meant to show you that hedge funds suck. Because this thing is literally just a lot of that's because of Hertz. But all right. That is my portfolio for this week. So I, my uh, portfolio is worth $676.96 and I funded it with $649.88. So we've made what? Uh, $27 on this, $27.11 and $8.63 in total earned dividends since I started this in November. So if you like this video, like and subscribe. If you want to, you can also leave whatever you didn't like about this. I'm open to constructive criticism. So thanks for watching.